Hello everyone, I hope you're all doing well and welcome to another episode of building accurate habitats in Jurassic World Evolution 2. In this episode, we are going to be focusing on one of the earliest ceratopsians to be discovered, the Chasmosaurus. As part of the ceratopsid family, Chasmosaurus is primarily characterized by elaborate nasal horns, a long frill, and a beak mouth containing rows of shearing teeth in the back of its jaw. Chasmosaurus would have been most recognized visually for the shape of the huge boxy frill on its neck that spread out like a canopy made of bone and skin over its neck and part of its back. Paleontologists suspect that the purpose for such a frill was primarily in mating rituals. It may have even turned different colors during mating season or used as a signal for other members of the herd. It also probably looked threatening to any other dinosaurs that might think to attack it. Another theory holds that it functions as a thermoregulating device for its body temperature. Whatever the case might be, one thing is for sure. Thanks to the discovery of a juvenile Chasmosaurus in 2013, one of the rarest dinosaur discoveries ever made, paleontologists know that young Chasmosaurus were not born with a huge boxy frill when young. The back of the juvenile skull frill is not broad and squared, as in an adult. Instead, the frill narrows towards the back and is arched with a ridge running down the middle instead of being flat on top from one side to the other as seen in adults. This episode will feature a complete species profile on the opening lizard and then feature an attempt at recreating its original environment in an enclosure. So let's jump right in and start getting to know Chasmosaurus, one of the last dinosaurs to have evolved before the great extinction that occurred about 65 million years ago. For those who like to skip ahead, I added some timestamps for you to click. For everyone else, let's begin. Chasmosaurus comes from a genus of ceratopsid dinosaurs that lived in North America during the Upper Cretaceous period about 76 to 75 million years ago. Its name means opening lizard in Greek, referring to the large openings on its frill. Chasma is Greek for opening or hollow, and saurus means lizard. It was initially slated to be named Protorosaurus, but this name had been previously used for another animal. Chasmosaurus lived at a time when the sea covered the Great Plains and turned western North America into a long skinny landmass called Laramidia. The sea levels changed many times during the Cretaceous and it might explain Chasmosaurus limited range. It helps further explain why, as of now, all Chasmosaurus remains that have been discovered have been limited to the area of what is now known as the Dinosaur Park Formation of the Dinosaur Provincial Park of Alberta, Canada. With a length of 14 to 16 feet long and a weight of 1.5 to 2 tons, Chasmosaurus was a pteratopsian of average size that could walk at about 5 to 8 miles per hour. As for the running, it is very likely that it was similar to many large bulky animals like elephants and hippos. Some paleontologists even speculate that most ceratopsians, like Chasmosaurus, may have been able to run as fast as rhinos, which can reach speeds up to 35 miles per hour. Like many ceratopsians, Chasmosaurus had three main facial horns, one on the nose and two on the brows. But on the two main species of Chasmosaurus, C. russell, which comes from the lower beds of the formation, and C. belly, which comes from the middle and upper beds, the horns are quite different. The horns in the C. russell species are somewhat longer, especially the brow horns, with a little bit of more curvature. Aside from these two main species, Chasmosaurus has a long convoluted taxonomic history, with five more species having been discovered. As mentioned earlier, Chasmosaurus would be most recognized for the shape of its huge boxy frill that spread out like a canopy made of bone and skin over its neck and part of its back. It is also very elongated and broader at the rear than at the front. The corner of the frill also features two larger osteoderms on the parietal bone, but the remainder of the rear edge lacked osteoderms. With C. Russell, the outer ones were the largest, while the opposite was true for C. belly. The parietal bones of the frill were pierced by very large openings, after which the genus was named. These were not oval in shape as with most relatives, but triangular, with one point oriented towards the frill corner. The sides of the frill were also adorned by 6 to 10 smaller skin osteoderms that are attached to a small mosal bone. With C. belly, the rear of the frill is V-shaped, and its sides are straight. While for the C. russell species, the rear edge of the frill is shaped as a shallow U, and the sides are a bit more convex. Paleontologists suspect that the purpose of such frill was primarily in mating rituals. It may have even turned different colors during mating season or used as a signal for other herd members. The fact that the bones of several individuals were found grouped in some sites suggests that they lived in herds. This helped the speculation that its frill may have been used for identification and attracting mates. Herding also indicates that Chasmosaurus had a social disposition and most likely protected the young or weak members of their species from predators. 
It's been suggested that its beak was its main defensive weapon, and it's possible that the frill was simply used to appear imposing or for thermal regulation. At first, it was believed that these frills helped protect their necks like shields. Holes in the shield don't make much sense though. While the frills may not have acted like armor, they could have protected the animal in some other way. Some theorize that when Chasmosaurus lowered its heads to charge, the frill would make the animal look twice as big, and such an illusion could intimidate a predator and prevent a fight. Others suggest that its frill may have been brightly colored with an elaborate display. Since the frill on these parts was a soft tissue, Chasmosaurus may have flushed blood into the area to make the colors more vivid. This flushing of blood theory has also brought forth the idea of a possible heat exchange device for thermoregulation with blood flushing into the area to allow it to cool across a large surface area. As for now, these are just theories but hopefully in the future we will know exactly just what its head endorsements were used for. With such unique characteristics, Chasmosaurus was chosen as a base name for the ceratopsian group called Chasmosaurine. The dinosaurs within this group are noted for large long neck frills and relatively short horns that include other species such as Panaceratops and Anchiceratops. Other details that make Chasmosaurus unique are recovered skin impressions, which are really unique for a dinosaur as very few skin impressions have been found. The recovered skin impressions from Chasmosaurus showed that their skin had five or six sided large scales in even spaced horizontal rows among smaller scales. Unfortunately, nothing can be learned about the coloration of its skin from the impression sample, so its true colors are still a true guess. However, the discovery of a juvenile Chasmosaurus, one of the rarest dinosaur discoveries, made headlines around the world in 2013 because for the first time ever, paleontologists had a complete skeleton of a baby ceratopsid. It's been suggested that Chasmosaurus may have cared for its young, like its relative, the Triceratops is hypothesized to have done. The discovered juvenile measured 5 feet long and was estimated to be about 3 years old, with similar limb proportions as an adult. This further reinforces the theory that they were relatively slow walkers as juveniles did not need to be fast moving to keep pace with adults. Most of the fossil was complete save for its missing front limbs which had fallen into a sinkhole before the specimen was discovered. Skin impressions discovered showed evidence that the juvenile may have drowned during a possible river crossing. Further studies of the specimen also revealed that juvenile Chasmosaurus had frills that were narrower in the back than that of adults as well as being proportionally shorter in relation to the skull. This forced paleontologists to go back to the drawing board as they had theorized that they maintained the same shape frill as juveniles. This just demonstrates just how fast the world of paleontology evolves over time as new discoveries are made. In 1898, Canadian paleontologist Lawrence M. Lamb of Geological Survey of Canada found the first Chasmosaurus remains which was a fragmentary piece of the neck frill. Although recognizing that his find represented a new species, Lamb thought this could be placed in a previously known short frill ceratopsian genus, Monoclonius. Lawrence designated the new species Monoclonius Bell to describe his new findings, with this specific name honoring a collector's name, Walter Bell. Lamb's original C. belly was joined by C. canadensis in the same year. This latter species has been described as Eoceratops canadensis by Lamb, but it was later reclassified by American paleontologist Thomas M. Lemon. By 1913, American paleontologist Charles Hazelius Sternberg and his sons discovered several complete monoclonus belly skulls in the Middle Dinosaur Park formation of Alberta, Canada. Based on these new finds in 1914, he designated a new name, Proterosaurus, but as mentioned earlier, this name was already being used, so he subsequently created the new replacement name, Chasmosaurus, in February 1914. And, in 1915, Chasmosaurus was then designated by Lamb to be within the Ceratopsia assigned subfamily Chasmosaurinae. The Chasmosaurinae usually have long frills like Chasmosaurus itself, where their sister group, the Ceratosaurinae, typically just have shorter frills. Since that date, more remains, including skulls, have been found that have been referred to as Chasmosaurus belly skulls, with several different variations discovered. Others are seen as valid species of Chasmosaurus or as a separate genus. Other fossil finds have produced some big results such as C. kaizeni, which bore long brow horns, while C. belly had shorter ones as mentioned. While these were at first named as different species, C. kaizeni and Eoceratops are, for now, thought to be examples of Ojoceratops. American paleontologist Richard Swan Lowell named the strange short muscle skull collected in 1926 as Chasmosaurus berberostris. 
A couple years later in 1940, American-Canadian fossil collector Charles M. Sternberg added Casmosaurus russell from the lower dinosaur part formation. The most recently described species has been by Thomas Lehman, who named Casmosaurus urbanensis, which stems from the top bed of the dinosaur part formation. The species got its very own genus, Bagaceratops, pretty recently in 2010. In 1927, Sternberg had theorized that of the two skeletons he had mounted at the Canadian Museum of Nature, the smaller one was the male and the larger one the female. Years later, in 1933, Lowell reaffirmed that theory by also suggesting that Casmosaurus kaizeni, which bore long brow horns, was in fact a male species of Casmosaurus belly, of which the female would have shorter ones. However, today the two are seen as different species by paleontologists. Then in 1987, paleontologist Gregory S. Paul renamed Phanaceratops Stenergi into Casmosaurus Stenergi, but this has found no acceptance within the paleontological community. And remember that species that was given its own genus, Phanaceratops, in 2010? Just recently in 2019, a National Geographic granny referred back Phanaceratops back to Casmosaurus gaining acceptance within the paleontological community. The reason we have so many Chasmosaurus species is due to some sites containing tens or even hundreds of individuals. The sites of bones were formed rapidly due to some catastrophic event, some even suggest volcanic eruption. But some research has suggested that it was an overflow of a river, which seems to point out that a whole herd was killed trying to cross the river by swimming. Its deposits also let us know that this horned dinosaur migrated long distances, just like many animals today. Like many animals in the Sahara herds of today, large herbivorous animals have to cross many rivers, and many individuals drown or are eaten by crocodiles in this endeavor. This gives some evidence of this phenomenon happening in the natural world today, the same way it could have happened then. On land though, in case a herd was attacked by a predator, males could have formed a ring, and with all their frills facing out, would have presented a formidable sight to predators. As pointed out earlier, the discovery of a juvenile Chasmosaurus astounded many paleontologists due to it being the first baby ceratopsian being discovered. One of the biggest surprises paleontologists discovered was in the comparison of the shapes and relative proportions of adult Chasmosaurus. The rare discovery reveals surprising physical traits and provides an understanding of the life history of horned dinosaurs like the well-known Triceratops. Michael Ryan, one of the world's top Ceratopsian dinosaurs researchers and curator of vertebrate paleontology at the Cleveland Museum of Natural History, mentions that Alberta has long been known as one of the centers for Ceratopsian research. The discovery and publication of the baby Chasmosaurus cements Alberta's leadership in that area. Now, let's talk about the environment that Chasmosaurus lived in to give us a better idea how to replicate its natural habitat. Chasmosaurus lived at a time when the sea covered the Great Plains and turned western North America into a long skinny landmass called Laramidia. The sea changed levels many times during the Cretaceous period, and this might explain Chasmosaurus' limited range. It might also explain why Chasmosaurus had such a variety of frill ships and horns, and why they only occur in Laramidia. When the sea levels rose, it would isolate a horned dinosaur population. Each population then developed new horn arrangements over generations. When the sea levels fell, Different species would compete with each other as they spread out, some would go extinct, while others would move on to new territory. The dinosaur part formation contained a wide variety of dinosaurs, fish, amphibians, and flora, indicating a rich environment. The landscape was dotted with ponds and swamps and bisected by wide meandering rivers with high sediment loads. This landscape also had a dual channel environment with sandbanks and floodplains very close to the western interior seaway. The prehistoric plants that were likely part of Chasmosaurus' diet and existed within the region were made up of cycads, ferns, and palms. The region also contained other species of coniferous and ginkgo trees, considering that it lived in a wooden region. Furthermore, Chasmosaurus shared its habitat, the east coast of Laramidia, with successive species of Centrosaurus. A certain niche partitioning is suggested by the fact that Chasmosaurus had a longer snout and jaws and might have been more selective about the plants it ate. Such a plentiful amount of food will bring with it numerous amounts of dinosaur species wanting to settle in such a fertile environment. Chasmosaurus rustled that belongs to a wide variety of dinosaurs, like the Ankylosaurids, which included the 50 foot long Diplosaurus, the 22 foot long Edmontonia, and the 18 foot long Scolosaurus. 
The landscape was also shared with various duck-billed dinosaurs such as the 27-foot-long Gyperosaurus, the tall-crested Corythosaurus, and the most famous duck-billed dinosaur of all, Parasaurolophus. Ceratopsian dinosaurs like the mostly unknown Spinops and Juancesia, a small Pachycephalosaur dinosaur of which paleontologists also know very little. Birds of Struthiomimus also roamed the landscape, always migrating towards greener pastures. Dinosaurs that might have preyed upon Chasmosaurus and the rest of the fauna included Tyrannosaurids like the 26 foot long Despletosaurus and his similar sized cousin Gorgosaurus. This formation also included Dromaeosaurus like the Troodon, and there are even some suggestion that Albertosaurus might have run into Chasmosaurus in some regions, but that is still to be determined. Chasmosaurus belly, on the other hand, would have interacted with Hydrosaurus such as the 30 foot long Proserolophus and another tall crested dinosaur named Lambiosaurus. Ceratopsis in this area include the 18 foot long Centrosaurus and its more famous relative Asterichosaurus. Additionally, only in this area would Chasmosaurus run into Panoplosaurus, a 16 foot long Ankylosaurus. This formation has provided paleontologists with vast amounts of fossils to study. With time, it is hoped that many more species are discovered. Unfortunately, being overshadowed by other more popular ceratopsids, Chasmosaurus has never been mentioned in the Jurassic Park books or movies, and it really isn't the sort of dinosaur that your ordinary member of the public would recognize. It wasn't entirely forgotten though, as it has appeared in video games like Jurassic Park 3 Park Builder as a dinosaur that can be cloned in the same way that it can be cloned in the Jurassic World Evolution series. A cool tidbit is that modified versions of bear sounds were used in the Jurassic World Evolution series to give the Chasmosaurus its unique sound. In other popular media, Chasmosaurus appears briefly in The Land Before Time 3, The Time of the Great Giving. At the beginning of the film, a pack of raptors attacks a Chasmosaurus in the mysterious beyond. One of the raptors lunges, and the screen fades into the Great Valley, and it is unknown what happens to that Chasmosaurus. Hello everyone, welcome to my park. As you can see here, it's slowly filling up, little by little. And uh, we're going to go ahead and do our Chasmosaurus enclosure right here. And uh, let's go ahead and do something similar to this picture that we see here. It's going to be, you know, um, some meandering rivers. We're going to have some sand. And on top of the sand, of course, you know, on the little top of the area, we're going to go ahead and fill it up with foliage. But first things first, let's go ahead and do our terrain. So we're going to have a couple of what you could call hills. Because on the bottom, that's where we're going to have our... Uh, a river so we're gonna build one mound here as you can see I have some gyrospheres going around because I think for ceratopsids you got to have gyrospheres I think that that looks just really cool um, so yeah let's go ahead and just build our mounds here and let's actually split the mounds in two so let's go ahead and flatten this part right here we're actually lower it. There we go. Lower it. Yeah, like that. And I think I'm gonna flatten it too much. Um, flatten terrain. There we go. That's what I wanted to do. There we go. Just a couple errors here. And there we go. Okay, we have our two mounds right here. And now we're going to work on our smoothing it out just a bit, not too much. We'll have some of those wonky emanations you get sometimes because it's too steep. But no, those mounds look good. After that, let's go ahead and work on our river system. So as you can see, this is one river system right here. And then we're going to make it go around like so. Ooh, the mound got smaller, but that's okay. Okay, so that's one, and then that's two right here. And actually, I don't think it can go all the way around. Oh, there we go. There it is. Boom. There we have it. We have our two mounds right here. And if you'd like, let's go ahead and build um, a nice land um, crossing there. And I think that we're good. We're good. Yeah, let's go ahead and... Uh, Start working with our rocks. That's uh, something that um, you kind of want to work on before your foliage because they kind of get lost in there. But you know, for now, just put some rocks. Um, I'd like to group them, as I always say. But you know, a couple here, not too much because then there won't be that much space for the Chasmosaurus. And 
you know, thinking about the space right now, let's actually shrink the shrink the river spit, okay? Because, you know, they need some space. There we go, I think that's a bit better. And let's connect this one again, there we go. There we go, get some, get some land back. <laughs> Reclaim some land. Alright, there we go. That looks pretty good. And now that we're done with rocks, let's add one more right here. In this little part, and right here. As I said, it's your it's your uh, enclosure, so you can do you can do what you like. Bit, this is how we're gonna go ahead and end it. After that, let's go ahead and work on our uh, terrain. So this is where we're gonna bring on our Bob Ross, our inner Bob Ross. And usually in other maps, the sand is not as dark as it is here, but we're just going to work with it. Usually the sand is, well, looks like sand. <laughs> this just looks like dirt, but it's apparently sand, so we'll work with it. In any case, if we work in, uh, in one of the tropical enclosures, I think this one's a temperate. That's why we have it, uh, the sand looking like this. But if you're working in a tropical enclosure like Isa Sorna or like Germany, you'll have the sand coming out really really yellowish and looking like actual sand from like the beach this i guess it is sand but it's just much darker but let's go ahead and just go all the way around in our embankments just how we have it in the picture and now that we've got our embankment let's do the outside embankments as well can't forget about those And now that we're done with that, go ahead and use rock, but the only thing we're going to use rock for is for here, for the actual river. It just gives it a bit of depth. Um, you won't notice it right away, but once you're done, you'll notice it just a bit. It gives the water some depth, so there we go. And now that we're done with that, one thing we can go ahead and do is go ahead and put in this grass because I think the grass that's currently there it's um, the mossy looking grass so we're gonna go ahead and switch it up in any case we're gonna go ahead and do um, I think we're done with terrain there's not much else you can do the other thing I usually like to do in our enclosure is that you know it's a tr trick from reddit is putting dirt on the most traffic paths you know usually like you go to a zoo or something you see uh, the most trafficked areas have, you know, the land is kicked up from so much traffic and the footprints and the zookeepers walking through and everything. But in this map, since there's a lot of sand embankments and this enclosure came out slightly, you know, it's kind of tight, then we're not going to go ahead and add that, okay? But in any case, the only other thing we're going to have to do is add our um, foliage. So a lot of redwood trees during this time, uh, it was a woodlands environment, but at the same time, like, like they mentioned, um, there are a lot of ferns, a lot of cycads, a lot of ginkgos. So again, you can go ham in this, uh, in this part when it comes to your foliage. I want to stick to the redwood forest kind of look to it. So one thing that we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and borrow from this part. The redwood forest is going to come this way as well. Move this. And then on this part, we're going, to go, we're going to grab a bit from that environment, which are the ginkgos. We have the ginkgos encroaching here. And once we have that, we have some Temskia. So let's go ahead and mix in the Temskia here as well. Let's actually make the Temskia, yeah, let's make it spread out just a bit more, not too much. We want to leave room for cycads and everything else. Um, and then right here, I kind of want to do red, uh, redwood forest too. This is actually perfect. And the rest right here, these mounds right here, I do want to do um, seed plants. Um, you can also use ginkgos or cycads. Let's go ahead and use cycads. Because um, it's going to be what makes up the majority of its diet. So we're going to use cycads here. Let's actually make them encroach over here. We're losing a little bit of the sand, that's why I don't want to use too much. So don't try to use too much 
or else you're gonna lose some of that sand. And after that on this mound, let's go ahead and do the seed plants like I mentioned. So we got some seed plants right here. Around, let's go ahead and use a little bit of the leafy climber since so this is some of the food that this guy eats. So Chasmosaurus, we're gonna add some leafy climbers. And again, this is for sandbox. Um, so, you know, you can go ahead and, you know, fix your comfort levels and stuff. But since this is sandbox, uh, we're adding just the foliage that, you know, was around during its, uh, during the time that it lived. So we're trying to make it as accurate as possible. And there you have it, guys. We have a river system. We have our little mound where we can have a little spots to go ahead and uh, um, propagate. And so, we, you know, go ahead and walk around. But I think it's a good enclosure. And in just a bit, we can go ahead and add our castmosaurus and you'll see how it looks. Being one of the most unique ceratopsids ever discovered, it is no doubt that Chasmosaurus is a beautiful but deadly addition to your Jurassic Park. Thank you all for watching, I hope you enjoyed this video, don't forget to like and subscribe for more. See you in the next one.